To move on to the interactive classes, we'll be looking at this in a very similar way to our enemy classes. So we're going to have a few different types of interactive classes in the project. Therefore, we can derive a lot of the general logic from a base class. The difference here is we're going to have multiple interactive classes where we only have the one enemy. We have the flip book ready for our heart and spring. So we know we have two classes available. And of course, you can expand this out. To get started, we will just make sure that we keep the project hierarchy nice and tidy. So we're going to create a new folder named Interactives. Inside of this, we'll be creating our main classes. So the first one is going to be our Interactive Base class. And of course, all we really need this to do is exist in the world with the potential to interact with the player. So for anyone familiar with Unreal, you're probably already aware that as far as the class hierarchy goes, or the class structure inside of Unreal, the most basic type of class that can exist in the world with a transform and that kind of physical entity is an actor class. So we're just going to come down, create a new blueprint class of type actor, and I'll name this one BP underscore interactive base. And like I've said, inside of this class, this is where we want to take those considerations, so the things which will be generic between the different potential interactive classes. For this project, I can only see two different variations that we'll be having, and between those, there's only two things I can see them needing to do. One is going to be more of an issue with the way that the flipbooks are set up, so a kind of workaround to that, and the second is the actual interaction. So we're going to need some type of collision for the player to cause that interaction to be fired off. And the issue comes from the fact that flipbooks are automatically set to play and loop. So we're going to need to account for that because the heart is going to look pretty good looping, but I think the spring, of course, we don't want that playing constantly. First of all, if we consider the components that we'll need for this, all we really need is the visual representation for the animation and the colliding act. And I'm going to separate these two out or the colliding component and I'll separate both of these out so that we don't need to worry about providing a per sprite animation on the animating flipbook. That would be some potentially extra performance calls that we don't need. What we'll do is we're going to encapsulate the entire flipbook inside of a cube collider. So for the components to begin, I'm going to add a new scene component. Just going to drag and drop it on top of the default component or the default scene component. This is purely so that we have like an anchor point and a transform for the other components to sit on, but we don't need that uh, spherical billboard representation. So we're going to get rid of that with a scene component. Then on top of the scene component, we'll place our paper flip book. So this will be the animation for the different sprites. And then making sure that we have the paper flip book selected. We can use the drop down again and find a box collider. So this will be the thing that the player will potentially interact with. And I'll just give this one the name of interactive collider. This will just make it a lot more kind of easy to update again, come back. It's going to be very clear why we have a paper flip book. It's a 2D game. We need that visual representation. It might not be so clear what the collider is doing. So if we name this accurately now, it will make things a little bit easier when we come back to the project. So the first thing to account for will be this collision setup. Looking at the paper flipbook to begin with, we can see that the collision channel is set to block all. So if we were to add a flipbook here and it did have some collision information, then this could potentially, again, taking into account things like the spring component, when we add that in, that would potentially block the character from moving. Rather than adding that impulse, it may actually stop you from moving around the level. What we'll do instead is we'll drop that collision preset option box down and we'll change this to no collision so this will not collide at all it won't provide any collision costs and we'll also make sure that we untick overlap events just in case anything changes so all of the collision is going to be done from our interactive collider if we have a look over here we can see that this is set to overlap all dynamic and we can make this a little bit cheaper if we just consider how we'll be using this so at the moment we can see the object type is a world dynamic type itself so this would mean at the moment that other interactive classes could potentially overlap with each other as they would with vehicles anything destructive uh, it could be things like i think the enemy classes are probably world dynamic as well so this could be triggered by an enemy so what we want to do is we're going to change this to custom from the drop down here i'm going to tick this button here the ignore the top one if you tick the top row it will change all of the options underneath. So we're going to make this ignore everything except the pawn. So the thing that the player is controlling is the only thing we want this to interact with. So this means now that anything else in the world won't trigger this functionality. It will make this a little bit cheaper to run. And it also means that we don't need to consider so many different eventualities with the collisions. 
Okay, so that is our components set up. We can now move over to the event graph. As we've done in the past, a few things that we can do here, we can get rid of the functions that we know we won't be using, which will be these two. And we only really have those two considerations that I've mentioned that we want to do or account for as a generic functionality for all of the potential interactive class. So the first one I think we'll address is that fix. So the way that this works, we'll just hop back into the viewport quickly. If you're not familiar with this, if we select a sprite for our flipbook, we've got the hearts and we have the spring. So when we place this in the world, this will do exactly what we have here. This will kind of pulse and pump with the heart, which I think looks pretty cool in the context of kind of fleshing out your world. It's quite nice to have these animated flip books and sprites. Having things like foliage moving around, the enemies pacing back and forwards, the pickups kind of animating in this kind of pulsing way here brings your level and makes the, uh, the, the level really feel lively and brings it to life. So this isn't something I want to cancel out altogether. However, if we then consider the FB spring, of course, we don't want this constantly springing nothing as we're just walking by it. Uh, we want this to only react. So this is going to be very reactive, which is why we've removed the event tick. And we want this one to only react and play this animation once when it's actually adding impulse to the player. So this will be the first thing we fix. And I'm just going to undo this. Like with the enemies, I want to make sure that if we ever forget to change this in the derived classes, it's very clear that we haven't given this a flip book because they'll be, well, they won't be showing anything. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull the paper flip book. We'll control drag this in. We're going to pull from here. And I'm going to search for looping. So we can do th find two things here. We could have just searched set looping, or we can check if it's looping. All we're going to do is immediately on begin play set whether or not we want this to loop. Hook this up to the execution pin from the begin play. Then the new looping, I'm going to select this and we'll promote this to a variable. And I'll just name this one B auto play. I'll make this public as well and compile this and just make sure that by default, let's assume that we want everything to auto play. And then we'll come in and we'll change this for the spring class. So what this will do is this will come in and it should check if it should carry on looping indefinitely or whether just it should be a kind of play once type of sprite. We've made this public so that if we ever wanted to override something for any reason, maybe we wanted a very special type of heart pickup that doesn't animate for some reason, then we could easily change that from the world outliner. Just here, when we've dropped it into our world, we could select it over here as you've seen before on other public properties. So that's the first part of the generic logic I think we'll need to be doing. The next thing is we're going to need this new function, which will be a thing that happens when we interact with the player. So I'm gonna create a new function like we did with the enemy base. I'll name this one interact. And very similar to the enemy base class, we're not actually going to do anything in here. Instead, I'll just set myself a reminder with a simple comment saying that the functionality is intended to be overridden in the child classes with their own kind of unique functionality. Now, one thing that because this is going to be very simple, you could extend this if you wanted by changing the interactive collider setup, you could have this interact with things like enemies. So if you wanted to implement systems where enemies could use the springs or they could potentially pick up health and share that kind of health pool of items with the player. So it would give the player some extra kind of challenge to make sure that whilst damaging the enemies, they're also not recollecting health somewhere else. You could easily change this to be accounted for. But in this project, what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that we're only going to be interacting with the player. So for the input, so that we have access to all of the health information and things like that, I'm going to create a new input here. I've changed the variable type here to be the BP underscore player base object. So we're going for this object reference. And I'll name this one the player ref. So we're going to use this in just a moment. So we'll make sure that we compile this and save. And that is pretty much everything we need to do for our interact function. Back in the event graph, we're going to get the interactive collider. And we want to go down here. Remember, we're doing the overlap events. So the overlaps, not the hits. The hit is what we were using in the enemy classes. The main difference being is that hit events act like a kind of a blocker. So you, if you remember that the collision needed to be resolved to the stage where the player was pushed out of its line in the Y axis and, and it was pushed to the background. In comparison, when you're doing overlaps, you can have two things pass each other. They're not going to physically stop each other, but we can have an event fired when an overlap is triggered or noticed, and that's using the on component to begin overlap. 
Now we're not going to need all of the information like we have in the past, but what I will do is because we want to call our interact function and we want our player reference, even though we know that the only thing that we should be colliding against is the player class, I'm going to do one extra check here. So we're going to cast this to the type of BP underscore player. See, we've got the BP underscore player base. And that way the interact function will now only ever be called if this is a successful cast. So if the thing we hit is definitely the player and not only that, but we can then pass in the reference to the player base, which means again, when it comes to adding health, adding impulse, we have some information that we can use about the player. And that's really it. So this is the base class done. This is the generic functionality that the child class, as we're about to create, can all inherit and reuse very simply. So if you've been enjoying this topic, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. And of course, hit the notification bell so that you'll get the updates as soon as the next topic in this playlist goes live. And remember, if you wanted access to the full mini course all in one go, you can get that through the Skillshare link down below or through the gold tier Patreon or above rewards. Just wanted to give a big thank you to all of the people already supporting me over on Patreon. It is, of course, your support that allows me to make the more in-depth topics like this mini course for the channel. As ever, thanks for watching and I will see you all next time.